Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India In the second half of the second module uh, we'll discuss there's three very important aspects together that is the relevance of the art practice in reference to nationalism and modernism as ideas for a nation building to make it simplified we need to understand how the visionaries behaved like activists and they perceived that folk and minor art has a prime role to play in the cultural politics of a country and especially in the colonial india it became much more relevant because that was a time when the countrymen were uh, in search of a new idiom of expression that is of their own so in search of that indigenous uh, expression uh, they tried to understand and realize quite a few factors that has uh, acted as a operational factor uh, in the colonial and of course in the pre colonial post colonial era and we are going to talk about the vision and the visionaries who realized that modernism and nationalism has some connection uh, and that built it up the importance of uh, folk and minor art practice in india to a large extent so in this three lectures we are going to understand uh, through examples and texts that uh, how it has shaped up and how it got executed in that particular time and what is the relevance of this particular activity in today's context so although being instinctive and primitive by nature has never been counted as a demerit for modern art folk art of india but it holds the potential to fall under a different subgroup which is perhaps still unnamed so in the beginning of the lecture when we talked about this misleading terms folk art itself is not a very clear term or when we say some art to be minor then what is the major stream that remains a question when we say is tribal art then who are the tribes and who are not the tribes so this is perhaps the question that we must hold and try to understand and answer that through the journey that we are taking up and for me as an instructor of the course i'm trying to gather as many information as possible and i'm going to connect them uh, in reference to the context of the importance of nationalism and modernism the concept of modernism that has come via europe but the nationalism and modernism had the similar fiber all over in the world so let's see how they were interpreted and how we look at them we can neither call it primitive if we associate primitivism in western european avagrad principle of modernity nor can any academic sophistication in its technique that transports it to the mainstream the avagrad artists in the west included revived primitivism to defy classicism this set the appreciative parameters for modern expression to overrule the illusion of space and confronted a new mode of idealism conforming to the basic simplicity 
similar to primitive and prehistoric culture. In colonial and post-independent India, primitivism was rather associated with nationalistic spirit by the activists who initiated a revival of indigenous art. During this time, the revivalist scholars realized the importance of folk art that was regional, religious and also vernacular in nature. For a long time, the folk aesthetics have confronted doubts whether the paintings are worth of any serious discourse or not. But eventually, with the endorsement of nationalism, context of folk art drew thoughtful attention as a newly found alternative aesthetics for our country. W. G. Archer found the tradition to be of some importance due to its primitive connection in the light of the pioneering Avagrad movement in the Europe. Whereas, Ananda K. Kumarswamy and E. B. Havel study between the years 1909 to 1935 on Indian art practice outside the mainstream Mughal court painting placed the regional art form on a higher pedestal. In their opinion on the potential of folk painting to contribute in a rise of modern Indian art under nationalistic spirit, E. B. Havel noticed the tradition as a turning point to revive indigenous style of visual expression. Obanindra Tagore, Nandalal Bose and other nationalists from Bengal school commented over the explored possibility of including the style and aesthetic principles of folk painting in their own artworks. In recent time, art historians namely Parthameter, Devashish Banerjee and R. Shivakumar are amongst the writers to access the significance of this experiments in their recent writings. So from here, we would like to understand how we invited modernism in the country's cultural history with the help of folk and minor art that was existing for a very long time without notice. It was something that was not really taken into a serious account for a very long time but the practice nevertheless went on and on and on. In the writing of Parthameter's uh, The Triumph of Modernism, India's Artists and the Avangrad, 1922 to 1947, Parthameter highlighted on some lesser known aspects of Indian art focusing at the turbulent end of British colonial era when the dawn of modernism offered Indian artists of early 20th century with a commanding device of colonial confrontation. He particularly mentioned two artists namely Sunayani Devi and Jamini Royce their works to be rich with folk components that was discussed thoroughly in Parthameter's writing. The devices of colonial confrontation that we try to understand in this particular context uh, was more like a codification in this direction where Bauhaus exhibition in 1922 in Kolkata marked an entrance of European modernism in India to potentially intervene and mingle with Indian nationalism. The decline of oriental art, changing nature of imperial patronage, rise of feminist voices, 
realization of primitive elements for independent artistic expression marked the modern India. So, it no longer followed a western way of looking at things. When we say western, we generalize it, but by saying western, we mean the European culture that dates back to uh, 16th century Renaissance, where the scientific perspective and the illusion of depth that was created in a uh, ground was considered to be the highest level of beauty. They have set up a parameter, in fact, into the Indian mind to go by that and that was known to be the ideal condition for them. That was also some kind of a idealism that is related to uh, realism. So, the naturalistic notions came much later in European modern art, but with that we should not also ignore a new possibility of the aesthetic quality that was provided by the primitive expressions or the prehistoric art. In our country, it was surviving in the form of folk and minor art. Uh, with that, the book of Parthameter, uh, it unveils another very important component that unveils inventing the Indian peasant to access the primitive reception in modern art as a partial dissolution and ostentation. It was not only the western intake for Indian art, but Steeler Cambridge introduced the modernity of style in urban folk painting of Kalighat Putter and Katha embroidered images of rural Bengal to European avant-garde. Staler Cambridge was the one who used to come and collect the uh, almost unrealized tradition of uh, embroidery that was done on the Katha surface and she was a great collector of that. Many of her collections are still preserved in Guru Shada Museum, Kolkata. And uh, if we look at them, we feel that how that particular tradition has also evolved, but it was a very, very significant and great realization from the part of this great visionary uh, activist, Stella Cambridge, that she established the fact of the realization of the importance of the indigenous culture and where we should place them, how we must realize them and get benefited by it. So, recognizing the aesthetic perspective of all those things were also uh, very crucial for that particular uh, moment. Until about 50 years ago, the researchers involved in the study of regional folklore and anthropology did not count on the potential of self-expression and the aesthetic value of folk paintings. The paintings were made in the pilgrimage and sold to temple visitors as souvenirs. They were valued for the rituals that they were associated with. So, it had a social purpose of course, but it was never realized as a artistic expression that this can also be a potentially a very uh, meaningful and effective expression of one's thought emotions uh, as an artist. So, it was in the beginning of 20th century that the handful of scholars started recognizing the aesthetic perspective of the regional artist artistry and threw light on them through their writings and speeches. So, in uh, 1916, it was Ananda Kumar Swami who made a visit to the uh, Western India, uh, Northwestern India in particular, to see the practice of Pahari miniature of Rajasthan and the Northern region uh, to realize how indigenous they are in their practice. And before that, or uh, almost in the same time, it was a confusion for many that miniature painting is only uh, 
confined to the Mughal court. Mughal miniature was popular to some extent and people also developed some bit of an appreciation for that particular tradition and uh, there had been collectors for Mughal miniatures at that time. But nobody realized the importance of Pahari miniatures, namely the miniature practices that was there in Bundi, Kota and all those regions, also partially the Kangra Valley miniature in Himachal Pradesh, uh, that also had a significant impact in the Indian culture. The only thing is there had been variation in style, but that was very difficult to realize unless somebody brought it into the uh, open um, daylight. And he was the one who collected and wrote about those traditions in a great detail uh, and through whom we got another exposure to a great tradition that was already there surviving for a very long time. It came with a much larger realization that it is not only the Persian influence that uh, gave birth to the miniature tradition in our country, but there had been parallel traditions which was going on and it got amalgamated and it got an eclectic characteristic uh, with the culmination of the great tradition of Mughal miniature painting. So, that added more dimension to the Mughal miniature painting as well. It was Kumar Swami to rehabilitate it all forms of Indian art regardless of academic or non-academic style to the European audiences. His writings enabled the viewers to grasp the aesthetics of rural and vernacular term of artistic expression. In 1900, uh, it was a time when the contemporary art scenario of Europe was experiencing a dynamic shift. Uh, with the idea of modernism. Painters from Germany and France showed significant zing to vitalize and reshuffle the existing norms of political uh, expression uh, through the pictorial term every now and then. They dared to rebuke the classical norms of image making to engage themselves into the new experiments with the new aesthetics that was connected to primitivism and that took birth to a new aesthetic of modernism which is much more simplified and devoid of many traditional rules. For a very long time the cultural enthusiasm of folk art was confined to Bengal in India. The exponents of Bengali region could sense the mode of European modern art that has corresponded to a liberated style that encouraged distortion, arbitrary qualities, symbolism and real space to achieve a rudimentary simplicity similar to folk art in our country. In Europe, the changes were caused by the newly beholden ventures of African art and also the tradition of Japanese ukiyo-e prints uh, that they traded from Japan at uh, that time and that was all about the printmaking of uh, the woodcut prints of um, Japan, um, the artworks of Sharaku, Hokushai uh, that came in through that uh, tra trade route and they also got exposure to the two dimensional quality of Persian carpet through the trade route. And through those aesthetic qualities of the flat color, the overlapping images, uh, it is a different perspective that was very, very far eastern where uh, the diagonal lines never got a recession and it never converged into a, a particular uh, vanishing point unlike the Renaissance compositions, rather they had a very different perspective that is known as a far eastern perspective where all the diagonal lines were parallel to each other and that made the back side, the uh, background of the painting in the same scale with the foreground to make it more revealing and uh, it just gives a very different uh, 
type of perspective alongside they used uh, the normal usual perspective also by overlapping vertical uh, location and many other devices that are uh, working as a general rule for all this kind of prints. So, through those images which were also having a very strong impact, some of the painters in Europe they realized that there is a possibility to get a, a better aesthetics uh, at least as an alternative. Uh, that can come through Persia from the decorative and flat color combinations of the Persian carpets as well as the ukiyo-e prints from Japan. The educated and visionary art lovers and art collectors of Bengal could identify the unique virtue of Indian folk paintings in non-academic category. They threw light on the archaic yet bold expression which is fresh, spontaneous, confident, it is also very simple and made out of the simplicity of means and the very distinctive style of folk art that is also various, it has tremendous variety and impact. Art critic Ajit Ghosh and artist Mukulde in 1900 20s were amongst the pioneers who began to collect the collect and preserve the living folk art works of their time. In 1930s, Guru Sadhadat, an Indian civil service official, travelled the remote villages of Bengal and made a large collection of folk art of the great significance. Slowly, more centers of folk paintings were located all over the country. I will quote a very uh, comprehensive and uh, clear writing from Jagdish Mittal. Jagdish Mittal writes, the term folk painting here encompasses pictures made in Indian villages by both men and women for ornamentation of their abodes, portrayals of their gods and for their various rituals and by local professional painters or artisans for use of the local people. The term also includes pictures made in the bazaars by hereditary painters to cater to the needs of the urban population and those made at centers of pilgrimage by traditional professional painters families. All these paintings were produced in a variety of styles and themes, history, sociology and geography infused the painting of each region with local flavor. To some extent, their style and quality depended on the materials available in the place in which they were executed. These very factors help us to identify them region wise and yet through all the apparent diversity there runs and underlying unity which makes them Indian. Guru Sadadat's contribution to the folk art of Bengal is counted as superior to all. He took interest in folk art to strengthen the social culture at large as the colonial administrator of British India. During his tenure as the district magistrate of Birbhum in Bengal, he initiated the first exhibition of Patua art in 1932 which is very significant by collecting numerous scroll paintings and songs associated to them. The collected papers in torn condition are now preserved in Guru Shadadat Museum in covered cases with restricted access. They reveal useful literature on folk arts and crafts of Bengal. Guru Shadadat divided human activities into three departments respectively uh, to reason, 
imagination and emotion to realize that a distinctive characteristic of a particular is not conditioned to any race or nation. According to him, the cultural contacts between the races and nation, although alarming, must not be restricted to enable enrichment in the existing cultural wealth. Guru Sadadar writes, the importance of folk art is realized as a fountain for renewal of national inspiration and for the resuscitation of national culture. For the folk art of a nation is the sincerest and most spontaneous collective expression of its essential philosophy of an outlook on life and of the distinctive moral and spiritual ideas of the race, of its simple joys and sorrows as well as of its highest aims and aspirations expressed through an art language specially suited to its race genius and embodying the imagery, turn of expression, tonality and rhythm peculiar to it and evolved through countless centuries by operation of the physical environment and spiritual and cultural values. This is from his writing, the importance of folk art and its relation to national culture, page 4, source, Guru Shadidat Museum, Kolkata. According to another scholar, another very significant scholar of our time, K.G. Subramaniam, K.G. Subramaniam in his book, Leaving Tradition, raised a very crucial point on cultural inheritance that neither should be counted as indisputable nor as obsolete. It is rather a question of originality that is also not free from preconceived notions and antecedents. He says that if we hypothetically take a person as the most original one and a purely original one uh, in the context, the person still may carry certain things in his gene that will make him, him less original. So, there is nothing called purely original and nobody can be completely original. And that is another uh, problem when we think of an idea like nationalism, where we feel that we are showing something which is completely of our own. It belongs to a nation devoid of all kind of possible influences from any other places. It is very difficult to perceive or uh, formulate that kind of an idea at the first place. So, he said that the traditional practice and contemporary content is based on how the artist as a creator combines his personal contribution to a tradition in sync with the former precedents to maintain the life that is irresistible. According to him, it is a circuit, it is almost like a creative circuit that makes the creative individual to contribute to its growth and receive a contribution into his own personal growth as well. In his view, the rationale of creativity in traditional art forms is operated by collective identities, but validity lies on their agreement to the needs and values of time. The collectiveness comprises of factors like ethnicity, regional identity of nationalistic obligations that laid people 
wants to identify the characteristic features of indigenous art traditions of India. It was unfair for the ruling governments of colonial India to undermine the unbroken tradition of existing regional art and craft which contributed and continued unbreakably for years. Other than E. B. Havel and Anand Kumar Swami, there were Okakura Kakuzo to played a pan Asian indigenism, Sister Nibedita, George Birdwood, who tried to look at the tradition to boost nationalism. On the contrary, in 20th century Europe, artists like Pablo Picasso, Mathis, Modigliani, Paul Klee, they welcomed modern expression in light of world's traditional culture. They drew great impetus for the like-minded artists and art lovers of India. Rabindranath Tagore, Abhinandanath Tagore and Nandalal Bose realized the need of an exposure to folk art from the language to broaden the sensibilities of modern art practitioners. Nandalal Bose worked with the Patuas of Bengal and his Haripura posters are the apt examples of this success. We are going to discuss it shortly by seeing the images. Right now, let us concentrate on the concept and realize their importance and slowly we will also see the examples and try to understand it once again afresh. Guru Shadadattu indicated a two-folded process with example from European nationalist ideologies. One is to hold into their folk art to rejuvenate patriotic feelings and the other is to reinvestigate primitive spirit to reintroduce simplicity. With the realization he ventured to save the folk art of Bengal with utter promptness that resulted in inspiring many. To Guru Shadadat's opinion Unlike the cultivated arts of the sophisticated stages of society in all countries often marred by the complicated formality and artificiality, an excessive elegance and an over refinement of mannerism broadening on efficiency, the folk art of every nation has a primitive purity, directness, vitality and robustness which serve as a perennial fountain for the rejuvenation and strengthening of a national life and art form art from age to age. This is based on a lecture delivered at the Postgraduate Department in Arts, University of Calcutta on 7th April 1932 and published in Prabuddha Bharat, October 1932. Guru Sadadatta strongly stated, let every child born of Bengali parents be placed from the earliest years in possession of all those things which are the distinctive products of the Bengali race and he will to echo the words of Cecil Sharp thereby know and understand his country and countrymen far better than he does as at present. At knowing and understanding them he will love them the more realize that he is united to them by subtle bond of blood and kinship and become in the highest sense of the world a better citizen and a true patriot. This is written by Guru Sadadar 
folk art and craft of Bengal, the collected papers, folk art and its relation to national culture, page 10. Source, Guru Shadadat Museum, Kolkata. It is clear from the statement uh, that uh, was made by Guru Shadadat that there had been uh, the immediacy to inject the nationalistic spirit into the common mind in that time. So, we will try to realize or re-realize that particular uh, statement and the sense that was evocative of uh, the mind building of the um, newborns and those who are uh, uh, influenced by uh, the nationalistic ideologies as a intrinsic part of their upbringing, uh, how they interpreted it in uh, that time and uh, we will try to realize it in reference to a more recent uh, quote from K. G. Subramaniam, which he wrote in 1987 on the context of cultural inheritance, uh, a similar spirit with more hard headed term. Each human being inherits when he is born into a society of any sophistication a large inheritance of culture that feeds, nourishes and gives direction to his growth. And to him, the society assumes a parental status. To his reaction to it is filial in a sort, it is torn between a feeling of affection and gratitude on one side and of resentment and rebellion on the other. Fundamentally, however, a tradition is based on a complex of situational factors of what we may call a work circuit, the motivation and rational of the activity, its conceptual and technological components, its emotional undercurrents. From this emerges its formal characteristics. When these factors hold constant, one can safely expect continuity in these characteristics and when they change, expect a corresponding change. It is evident therefore, from the fact that revival of folk art principle aided the nationalistic movement in our country during the pre-independence era and even long after the independence when nationalism lost its immediate significance. Folk art did not lose its relevance that marks the core of creation. Folk art practice implies the fundamental questions of inheriting the eventually contributing to the tradition, steering its growth further. Folk paintings being deeply rooted to life and living crosses the initial paradigm of spiritual foundation to respond to the real happenings and thereby constantly shuffles its creative modality, pertaining morality adjusting to the values of contemporary society with traditional value system. It faces the challenge of constantly balancing between the modern sensibility, promptly responses to the current happenings and the responsibility as an inheritance of an age-old ethical foundation. So, to uh, conclude the topic of classification and connections and the traditional roots which is more like a literature survey that we have had uh, for the past few lectures as um, the second module of uh, our discussion. It was more like uh, reading, understanding the uh, different sayings of different people. We would try to conclude this particular um, discussion uh, 
by realizing the relevance of the art practice. Uh, so, let us jot down the points that we have uh, discussed so far in a uh, connected uh, manner. Uh, 